I have talked before about a woman who is one of my heroes, but I found more of her story that I did not know. All I've ever had was a photograph of Kashia Thomas uh, that I keep in my office. The photograph is um, a picture of a man that is on the ground um, who has a, a Confederate flag on his shirt and an SS tattoo. And he is being covered, protected by a black woman named Kashia. And uh, this picture has always been really, really, um, sp has spoken to me a lot. And I just found more of her story as was written by the BBC several years ago. And so, you know, it's the British. They write so beautifully that I didn't want to try to rewrite it. So I'm going to read you a little bit from this article from the BBC. Kashia Thomas was 18 when the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist organization, held a rally in her hometown in Michigan. Liberal, progressive, and multicultural, Ann Arbor was an unusual place for the KKK to choose, and hundreds of people gathered to show them that they were not welcome. The atmosphere was tense, but controlled. Police in riot gear and armed with tear gas and a small group of Klansmen in white robes and conical hoods. Thomas was with a group of anti-KKK protesters on the other side of a specially erected fence. Then a woman in a megaphone shouted, there's a Klansman in the crowd. They turned around to see a white middle-aged man wearing a Confederate flag t-shirt. He tried to walk away from them, but the protesters, including Thomas, followed just to chase him out, quote. It was unclear whether the man was a Ku Klux Klan supporter, but to the anti-KKK protesters, his clothes and tattoo represented exactly what they had come to resist. The Confederate flag that he wore was for them a symbol of hatred and racism, while the SS tattoo on his arm pointed to a belief in white supremacy or worse. There were shouts of kill the Nazi and the man began to run, but he was knocked to the ground. A group surrounded him, kicking him and hitting him with the wooden sticks of their placards. Mob mentality had taken over. It became barbaric, said Thomas. When people are in a crowd, they are more likely to do things they would never do as an individual. Someone had to step out of the pack and say, this isn't right, she said. So the teenager, then still in high school, threw herself on top of a man that she didn't know to shield him from the blows. She said, when they dropped him to the ground, it felt like two angels had lifted up my body and laid me down. For Mark Brunner, the student photographer who took the picture that I have, who witnessed the episode, it was who she saved that made Thomas's actions so remarkable. He said, she put herself at physical risk to protect someone who, in my opinion, would not have done the same for her, he says. Who does that? <laughs> the story goes on to talk about how uh, Kashia had been a victim of violence herself. She never got specific about what kind of violence, but she talks about how she knows that feeling and she knows it's horrible and she wanted to protect him from that kind of hurt. Jesus, when he told this parable, he would have specifically chosen a Samaritan, and I think it's for that reason. The Samaritans would have been hated, reviled by the Jews. A Samaritan would have known what it is to be ostracized, possibly even a victim of violence himself. 
This week, we have coming up another one of our summer camps. It's our elementary ROTC, Reaching Out to the Community. We use this story often. Uh, in the mornings, the kids, we go and do service projects out into the community. And then in the afternoon, we sometimes will do something fun like go bowling or something like that. But we always have a program time. And w during that program time, for the elementary kids in particular, we like to use parables and stories. And this is one of the cornerstone stories that we use. And so Barbara McCall, who's our director of, of children and families, she does it godly play style. And if you've ever heard her tell one of her stories in godly play, it's, oh my gosh, it's magical and just mesmerizing. She just rolls things out and she has that teacher voice that she does and she pulls each of the characters out and you see the donkey. Wa oh, it's so great. <laughs> and she tells the story, this parable of the Good Samaritan. And part of working with godly play is the children hear the story and then you ask questions and they're called wondering questions. And these wondering questions engage the kids in the story by using their imagination. So we might say, I wonder what that innkeeper was thinking of all of this. I wonder where the Samaritan was going in the first place. I wonder why the robbers attacked. And I wonder why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. Now, most of us have heard and understand that probably the reason the priest and the Levite didn't stop is because they were following the law. If they had touched an unclean body, if they had touched blood, they would have been unclean, ritually unclean, and they could not have gone to do their job, to do their duty. In their minds, they were following the law. But the kids don't know this. So to hear their answers is pretty great. Um, often they will say something like, maybe they were afraid the robbers were still around. And often they will say, well, maybe they have a family to take care of themselves and it was too dangerous for them to stop. Sometimes we will ask, who is the robber's neighbor? Who's the priest's neighbor? And these kids and their beautiful answers always come from a place of love and kindness. And from that, then they can begin to see their work, the work that they did earlier that morning at the thrift store or, you know, packaging up shampoo at giving the basics, something like that. They can begin to make that connection between what they did in the morning and this parable. And they're participating in an act of mercy themselves. What we hear today in the gospel, in this story of Kashia, is instead of allowing pain and violence to turn them bitter, walled off, or even violent themselves, Kashia and the Samaritan allowed God to transform their pain, the violence that had happened to them, redeem it, and turn it into empathy and compassion. We often hear the phrase that hurt people hurt people, right? People who are hurt, hurting, will hurt other people. And yes, that is true, but it is also not true, <laughs> Often uh, when you're helping a child deal with a bully at school, one of the first recess lessons that you learn is the kid who's being mean to you is hurting on the inside, right? God can transfigure the pain of the crucifixion and turn it into Easter. And so... When we allow it, God can take our own pain, our own violence, and 
resurrect it, transform it into something new and beautiful. And so I wonder, in those moments in our life, when we're maybe acting unneighborly, <laughs> it happens. Where is the hurt? Where is the violence that that's coming from? When we see someone else who is acting in a way that is unmerciful, violent, unneighborly, what's the pain that's driving them? And how can we pray for for God to transform that pain. That is the gospel call today. To allow God to take that pain, that violence, that hurt, betrayal that's in our lives, and make it something wholly new so that we can live into those acts of mercy and compassion. Kashia never saw that man again after that day. But she said one day, a few years later, she was in a coffee shop and a young man walked up to her and said, thank you. And she said, for what? And he said, the man that you saved that day was my father. We never know... <laughs> how far the ripple of mercy and kindness will extend. These acts of real, active, tenacious, really even obstinate kindness, it ripples out into the world in ways that we cannot fathom. Amen.